The modern art revolution that later critics would nickname Gothic began in Paris and spread rapidly, first through France and then beyond it to England, Germany, and Italy. Like the Romanesque style, Gothic architecture and art would change its features more than a little as it traveled. Now, at this period in history, England was heavily influenced by developments in France. Its new ruling elite, the Normans, came from northwest France, although the Normans themselves were not, were, as the name suggests, originally Vikings, and Normandy was not yet considered part of France. But the Norman raiders held lands in both England and Normandy and crossed the channel frequently. Moreover, as I mentioned in my last lecture, uh, the late Norman cathedrals at Cannes and Durham already employed some of the most important Gothic architectural innovations, the pointed arch, rib faulting, and even at Durham, internal flying buttresses. So let's kick off this last Gothic lecture with one last clip from a white garment of churches. England's a greatest Gothic cathedral at Salisbury was begun the same year as the High Gothic Cathedral at Amiens. So what obvious Gothic features do you see here? Well, the heavily decorated facade is clearly Gothic, as are the tall lancet windows in the Westwork. But what looks different? Well, the facade, the Westwork, is actually a kind of false front. It's considerably wider than the nave behind it, nor is the facade as tall as Amiens or other high Gothic French cathedrals, including the infamously dangerous and still unfinished Cathedral of Beauvais, which you just saw in the video. The English, or again, more accurately, the Normans, since they still spoke an early form of French, not the Germanic Anglo-Saxon that would mingle with Norman French to become English. The Normans were not as obsessed with height, except in their spectacular crossing towers. For that reason, the flying buttresses here are really more decorative features than engineering necessities. Uh, let's look at a side-by-side -side comparison of Amiens and Salisbury, and you get a better sense of the difference in the facades there, and of course, the difference in the crossing tower. These photos do a little better job of capturing the greater height of Amiens Cathedral and the much more imposing crossing towers of Salisbury. Now, when I think of the Norman churches in England, and I spent a couple of years there uh, doing my graduate degree, I think of spires. They dominate the landscape for miles around, are much higher, particularly in proportion to the church, than they tend to be in French churches. Uh, the comparisons are easier to make using the floor plan. Sorry these aren't bigger. I didn't want to miss, mess with those helpful red lines, which I'm gradually bringing in here. Sorry. Are they all there? Oops, I was afraid that might happen. There we go, back to that. Um, the photo on the bottom right is the Google Earth image of Amiens Cathedral, which makes it easier to see the apse with its chevettes or apse chapels. The image on top is actually a painting by one of my favorite painters, Turner. Uh, we'll see a lot more of his work next semester. Turner painted Salisbury Cathedral from the east, so this way you can see the rectangular apse more clearly. Uh, I should know that many French Cistercian churches also had a similar flat apse, and this reflected Bernard of Clairvaux's criticisms that churches were becoming distractingly ornate and complex. This is essentially a somewhat simpler model. Uh, here's a better look at the cathedral and also at the painting. So again, what similarities do you see between these two churches? Uh, now we're looking, of course, at the interior view. Well, both churches have a three-story nave elevation. They have the four-part rib vaults. Actually, that doesn't show up on the, um, very clearly in the Amiens picture, but you've seen them in other pictures. Um, and what are the big differences you see? Well, most notably at Salisbury, the pier colonnettes stop at the springing or the bottom of the arcade arch. Oops, just a second. Sorry, I just lost my notes here, which I'm reading from my iPad. Um, oops. Uh, and the rib vaults rise from the Triforium, or second level. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I don't have a printer here. At Amiens, they soar all the way to the rib vaulting on the ceiling. So the result is a much more horizontal emphasis at Salisbury, and if you will, more down to earth. Maybe the Anglo-Saxons were already rubbing off on the Normans. On the other hand, the carvings on the Triforium are very similar between the two churches. Whoops. 
<laughs> okay, do we have everything there? You should have that on your slides. Uh, since I, once again, I don't think still fit photos do this magnificent cathedral justice, let's take a quick video virtual tour. Uh, here, by the way, is an image of the strainer arches that you just saw in the Art of the Western World video. Uh, they likewise emphasize the horizontal, although they also draw your eye upwards with the upper part of those arches. Uh, very interesting and very uniquely British style. Uh, note the complex rib vaulting on the ceiling as well. In the early 13th century, English Gothic churches developed increasingly complex internal decoration. This image is not in your book, but I thought it provided an especially clear view of the complex rib vault and the elaborate tracery around the windows that characterized the English Gothic style of this period. Uh, and here is the decorated cloister of Gloucester Cathedral with its famous fan vaulting. Uh, the origin of that term should be obvious. By the way, if you think this corridor looks strangely familiar, yep, several of the Hogwarts scenes were filmed in Glo uh, Gloucester Cathedral in the sixth Harry Potter movie. It, by the way, has been a huge boom for the cathedral, which is now actually raising enough money for repairs because of its Harry, very popular Harry Potter tours. And here's the chapel of Henry VII, I talk about over the top uh, decorative vaulting. This is not architectural vaulting, by the way. It's really the diaphragm vaults across the nave that support the roof, as they did in Romanesque churches. These rib vaults are there for show. This chapel also contained the tomb of Henry VII and his wife. Elaborately decorated tombs were a feature of later Gothic churches and would carry over into Renaissance and Baroque churches as well, as we shall see. So here is the elaborate freestanding Gothic tomb of King Edward II in Gloucester Cathedral, a.k.a. Hogwarts. Uh, note how much these tombs resemble reliquaries, and they were visited with much the same passion. And here's one of those useful summary slides, lightly edited. Well, while German churches adopted the rib vaults fairly early, otherwise they clung to the Romanesque for about a century after Gothic art swept France. Germany's most famous Gothic cathedral in Cologne is in Cologne. The date here is misleading, by the way, because the cathedral took 600 years to finish. Of course, Beauvais never got finished at all. On the other hand, the cathedral survived heavy bombing in World War II that took out almost all of the newer buildings around it. The glass went right away and the rest of it stood. So note how similar the nave is to the cathedral at Amiens, shown at the upper right. Now, I've shown you hall churches before, and it's a term that does show up on the AP test. In hall churches, which are usually found in Germany, the aisles are the same height as the nave, so there's no tribune, no triforium, no clerestory. So here's an internal photo of the hall church of St. Elizabeth in Marburg, Germany. The design helps make the interior of the church bright and free-flowing. Uh, it's less dramatically decorated. This is typical of the somewhat more conservative German style. Uh, these two elevations should give you a clearer understanding of the term hall church and how this uh, reflects differences in the way the nave and aisle are constructed. Uh, and here is still another summary slide. French Gothic sculpture styles, as well as French Gothic architecture, traveled to Germany in the 13th century. Here we see a carved tympanum from Strasbourg, which, by the way, is now part of France, but was a German-speaking and really was until uh, up to World War I. Note the rippling drapery, the fairly clear delineation of anatomy under the garments, the emotionalism of many of the figures, and in general, the drama of the sculpture, and it's the drama which is actually its most characteristically German element. Uh, these are statues of the donors of this cathedral, and they're not nearly as emotional, but they're still highly individualistic. And by the way, the sculptures were made well after these people lived, so there's no real reason to assume that they were individualistic in the sense that they looked like the people themselves. But still, we're seeing here more evidence of high Gothic humanism. Note especially the arm that's clearly outlined beneath Uda's cloak, and she draws it up to protect herself against a harsh German winter. That's, I think, a very personal, very human gesture, and I'm guessing cold churchgoers could relate to it. <laughs> 
Uh, I've mentioned the new confidence of the 12th and 13th centuries as the economy and population grew, as towns and universities blossomed, as faith became more triumphant and also more comforting. Well, all that changes now. Uh, the 14th century brought a terrible new wave of bubonic plague, which killed a third of Europe's population. Uh, lots of different estimates about that because we don't, you know, nobody took reliable census back there. But, but one guess is about 20 million people died. The death count was especially high in the crowded towns and cities, which was a major setback for the urbanization that had been driving high Gothic culture. In Paris, an estimated 800 people a day died during the plague plague months of 1849. And the death toll was also very high in monasteries because, of course, people there, too, lived in close quarters. Some, some other events of this delightful century, uh, the Hundred Years' War between France and England devastated much of France. The church, by the way, in the end, it would help unite France under Joan of Arc, but it would wreak a lot of havoc before that. The church experienced a schism. Do you remember the Babylon captivity of the popes where you had rival popes in Avignon and Rome? And obviously that undermined church authority. The Ottoman Turks were on the march. Uh, they conquered Constantinople. They went on to conquer much of Eastern Europe, and they were actually advancing on Vienna where they were turned back but just outside of Vienna. And finally, this was a t century of terrible climate change. But in this case, it was global cooling, or what is sometimes known as the Little Ice Age. Uh, farms became dramatically less productive because the growing season shrank and some areas were no longer productive for farming. And as a result, there was widespread famine, depopulation. This was a grim time. By the way, it's at all interested. Barbara Tuckman, who's a very, very readable a historian, wrote a history of this century called A Distant Trumpet. She actually wrote it during the 1970s because she was drawing parallels uh, to the difficult times around the uh, era of the Vietnam War. Anyway, it's a very good, very readable book if anyone's interested. So this sculpture reflects the horrors of the 14th century and the religious response to those. So the self-confidence of high Gothic Christian humanism is gone in this artwork. And in this time, much religious art, like ordinary life, was infused with images of suffering. People sought to find meaning in the catastrophes assaulting them. And one of the things that happened was that there was more identification with the suffering Christ. And remember, early Christian sculpture didn't show crucifixion scenes at all. Byzantine sculpture tended to emphasize, you know, the triumphant world ruling Christ. You have the stern judging Christ of the Roman Asgard. You have the warmer beau dieu uh, and his and his mother in high gothic art and we're seeing now a movement again to more focus on the crucifixion but this has also always been an element of german art remember the garrow crucifix but note also that in some ways the statue represents humanism taken to a new level it shows more emotion more movement more freeing of sculpture from its architectural surroundings we're going to see more of that as we move into the renaissance era uh, German Gothic artists also excelled at metalwork, as this spectacular repousse altar demonstrates. Note the comparison with the early medieval doors of St. Michael's at Hildesheim, which is another splendid example of German metalwork craftsmanship. So here's a detail uh, from the altar showing Samson slaying the lion. The work, by the way, is gilded copper with enamel, kind of interesting, and the telltale colors. So here is a reliquary, probably also made or at least begun by Nicholas of Verdun, uh, and it was believed to contain relics of the three magi. So the, the pilgrimages, the relics remain important into this period. That's something you should note. And again, here's a detail from the reliquary, which was made of silver and bronze with gemstone and enamel decoration. You can see the enamel on the columns. Very, very intricate work. Again, just spectacular craftsmanship. So this is probably the most famous Italian Gothic cathedral. Now we're moving into Italy and actually should have done more of an introduction. It, the Italians have gone a somewhat different way in all of these period. In the, Rom, in the Romanesque period, they did not abandon the, the early Christian, really Roman basilica style nearly as much uh, as was done further north. And when you get to Gothic, you're still looking at some more characteristically Italian buildings 
and increasingly Renaissance buildings because the Renaissance, of course, begins in Italy. But again, uh, you see Gothic with Italian flourishes or Italian with Gothic flourishes, depending on how you want to look at it. So what French Gothic elements do you notice in this cathedral? Well, there are the pointed gables over the door. That's typical of the high Gothic. And so are the pinnacles, which are pretty over the top here. What differences are there? In particular, that carved, painted ornamentation belongs more clearly to the Italian Renaissance. So here's a close-up of one of the images uh, underneath these gables. The gables, again, are those pointed triangles here decorated with uh, carved, I don't know that they're called archivolts when they're on gables, but uh, the, the carved decoration around them. Uh, would you, any guess as to what medium the artist used in this work? Yes, it is mosaic again. Uh, we see a lot of Byzantine influence in Italy, particularly in Venice. Um, the, this later Milan cathedral includes some seriously over-the-top Gothic decoration, including pinnacles, but the shape of the building actually shows more classical influence. There's really a basilica there underneath all those uh, carvings and spires. Uh, and that shows that the building is as much an early Renaissance as a Gothic building. And that's where we're heading now.